Welcome back to the Black Pill. Uh, so for the epistemology series, we're looking at different ways people might claim knowledge as possible. How can you know anything? How can you have certainty about everything? And we're breaking those ways of knowing, showing that they don't lead to certainty. Sometimes they lead away from uncertainty, but they don't lead to certainty. Certainty is a feeling. And let's take on observation. Is seeing believing? Uh, TLDR, you know, spoiler alert, nah. Of course it isn't. So, who's in charge of a pride of lions? If you went to school in America, there's a pretty good chance you believe the lion is in charge of the pride of lions. So the male lion with his magnificent mane of hair, that's the boss of the pride. And you might further believe in alpha animals, the alpha wolf, the alpha lion. And of obviously wrong, right? If those things were true, I wouldn't be bringing them up right now. Think of who first described lions for science. And it was European uh, explorers, European colonial powers. And they were there because King Leopold or whoever sent them there. Um, they're already primed to think of things in, in, in terms of monarchies because number one, they come from a monarchy where might makes right. King Leopold has a crown, King Leopold is in charge, King Leopold has the mightiest armies, and that's what makes King Leopold the king. Might makes right. He was placed there divinely, and he has all the power to prove it. Also primed, though, by Linnaean taxonomy. And these first taxonomies talk about the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom. We're thinking in the hierarchical terms of monarchies, of feudalism. So they, they go out and they make these initial observations and they see lions. It's a bunch of uh, meek females guarding the cubs and the lion. One lion resplendent in his golden crown, right? With his hair all, all uh, blowing in the wind and his magnificent gigantic testicles and the explorers in their pith helmets go, that is the king of the beasts. And they imagine he's somehow in charge of the pride of lions. Lions, of course, aren't in charge. Lions are uh, sperm donors. Yep. So the females need the fittest, most most resplendent, muscular example of lionhood to father their babies. They look. They look for those characteristics. They get those characteristics because the plains of Africa are full not only of other lions, but of other kinds of predators. So, they don't necessarily need to give birth to more massively testicled, golden-maned lions. They need lionesses. They need females of the species who also have these characteristics of strength so that they can hunt. They can hunt gazelles. Not to dominate other lions, but to dominate the other species on the African plains. And the lion himself is really a security guard. He keeps the other lions at bay, as well as the jackals, and especially the hyenas, who would eat those young with the drop of a hat and try to steal the kills, whatever they bring back to the camp. Females, though, make all of the important decisions. Because females do the hunting, and most of the important decisions are about hunting. Will we stay at the waterhole, or will we follow the herd? Will we take on a risky prey animal? A lion can't kill an elephant. A lion is an inconsequential threat to an elephant. 
but a pride of hungry lions can kill an elephant. You'll hear them uh, laying around in the dark, growling at each other in what it's hard not to say as a conversation, making a decision. Because they can kill an elephant, but one of them is getting her ass stomped in the process. Right? We're, the, the, the chances are good we're losing a member of the pride in taking down, taking down this high-value target. So the females really make all of the important decisions in day-to-day life. They choose who's going to stay behind and watch the young and whether to follow the herds and what level of risks to take. So, so science, science had it wrong. Um, for 150 years, we had it wrong. We relied on the observations of people who were not trained scientists. And they showed up with a lens that they used to make their observation. And that lens was monarchic imperialism. So this happens all the time. It happens all the time that our observations are led astray by our previous experiences, and that's what we call biases. Our observations are biased, right? They're biased by our internal factors, but also by external factors. Let's ask a question that at the outset is going to sound kind of racist. Who's taller in America? On average, who's taller, black men or white men? You know, vote. Write your answer down somewhere. I'll wait. When I throw this question out in classrooms, most of the time, most of the people think that black men are taller than white men. And then we have to get to why. Because obviously that's false, right? You've been hanging out with me long enough to know that all questions are trick questions here. Why would we believe black men are taller when white men, in fact, are on average, one inch taller than black men? And the answer is the media we consume. In particular, if you are not yourself black, this is a racist and segregated country, and so most of the black men who you see in the course of your day are on television and in the movies. They are athletes, football players and basketball players who are selected for their size. Sports commentators, who are themselves former athletes. And movie stars, where height tends to be equalized unless it's important to the telling of a story. By now, everyone knows that Tom Cruise is 5 feet 7, but when he's in a scene with Denzel Washington, who's 5 feet 11, the camera angles and whatever they're standing on just equalize their height unless it's important for the story in some fashion. So we get this false impression. We had this false impression about the relative sizes of black and white people. This has tragic consequences. White people see black men as larger than in fact they are and feel threatened. White people see black children as older than they are. Tamir Rice, uh, God, I should have looked this up before I started talking. He was about 13, and the officer who shot him saw an older person. Um, When Darren Wilson shot Michael Brown, we uh, we have his radio activity, and he's talking to the dispatcher, and he says, that guy is huge, but Michael Brown was the same size as Darren Wilson. Um, yeah, our misperceptions absolutely matter. When we're making our observations and those observations are false, those things absolutely matter. Now, black people are on average one inch shorter than white people in America because of racism. And it's not racist to talk about racism. (sighs) Because poverty in this country accrues to skin color. The darker one's skin, the more likely they are to be poor. 
and because our height in inches depends not only on our genes, but on access to calories in childhood, black people are on average one inch shorter. All right. So all the time we're out wandering through the world, making observations, trying to generalize those observations. In the ancient world, that was the best information that we had. 50,000 years ago, there were no facts written down. Data didn't exist. The very best you could do was rely on the evidence of your senses in your immediate environment, or at best, ask an older person what they had seen in their time. Now we have better information, but we're over-specified not to rely on that information. We're over-specified to trust our own senses. And that's not good enough. So observations don't lead us towards truth. They might lead us away from falsehood, but that depends on whether there's error in the environment. That is, whether the media we consume are biased in some fashion or not. So the next part of this equation for us is going to be representation. In the past, all the way up until now, look, in the beginning, black people were just absent from American media, or largely absent from American media. And then when black people started to be included in American media, they were, their characters were written by white people so that they appeared in the media in a way that would be satisfying to white folks to tell the stories that were written by white folks and fulfill those narratives. And it's only super recently, in really the last five or ten years, that we start to reliably get black or African-American characters written by black or Af African-American writers directed by black directors and produced by black producers to tell stories that they would like to have told. And there's immediate pushback on this from the so-called alt-right hereafter referred to merely as fucking fascists, right? Whenever there's a Wonder Woman or a Black Panther or a Star Wars that pivots from the story of a young white man to a female lead character and a black lead character, tremendous pushback, complaints about forced diversity, exactly because the fascists want you to re rely on bad observations, on biased observations. They just want you to watch the 1990 uh, reality TV show, Cops, and not see any positive representation, because that would lead you to make positive decisions. So, observation is out. Lesson over.